This session is called God and Nature, and I think it's a reasonable association. In a way, it explains itself. But you may be wondering why I've got Jane Metcalf on the program, because she's here to talk about the neurobiological revolution, among other things. And, and the reason is that um, I, I subscribe to her newsletter. It's, it's an exceptional piece of work, comes out regularly, and is full of extraordinary tips about what's on the horizon. She's a scout, in a way, uh, of all these marvelous new technologies, generally the positive aspects of them. And I have found, I hope I'm not imputing too much, Jane, that you do it with reverence. You do it with great enthusiasm, but you do it with reverence. So uh, on that basis, I, I wanted to uh, reconnect with Jane because we met first about a million years ago. Um, I, I was in rock and roll at the time, uh, well, the television part of rock and roll. And uh, she and her partner, uh, Louis Rosetto, had just started a magazine uh, called Wired. And their insight uh, at the time, I didn't fully understand it, but brilliant it certainly was, was that technology would be the next rock and roll. And they, of course, helped to define that entire culture by building a magazine that acted as a mirror for that community, led that community, and did that not only with the words in the magazine, but the whole layout, the graphics, uh, as well as the agenda. Uh, time has passed by. I haven't been in touch uh, personally with Jane, and, and I thought this was the perfect occasion to do that. So please welcome Jane Metcalf. Thank you, Moses. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction and for the invitation to Idea City. I am delighted to be here. You know, I haven't been in Toronto since the first time I came, well, that's not true, I've been back, but the first time I came to Toronto was about 23 years ago, and it was to announce the launch of Wired and the advent of the digital revolution, which I considered the story of our times back then. And in fact, Ad Age Magazine called it the magazine of the decade, so I think others thought so too. Um, you know, we eventually sold the magazine, I got out of the media business entirely. I got out of the revolution business too, for that matter, um, until now. Now I see a new revolution on the horizon, and it made me want to start another media company to tell the story about the people and the companies and the powerful ideas and the incredibly powerful technologies that are getting ready to happen to us. And so the company's called Neo Life. You can find us at www.neo.life because that's just way cooler than .com. Um, and uh, so I want to tell you today about what I'm calling the neobiological revolution. So we are sequencing our genomes. We're mapping our brains. We are harnessing things like DNA and bacteria and viruses and yeast in order to create new species, new opportunities, new energy sources, new drugs, new therapies, we are evolving ourselves. This is Homo sapiens seizing control of our own evolution. So I call this the neobiological revolution. It's the accelerating movement harnessing the latest advances in technology and biology to alter the human race. It is the next stage of the digital revolution. So here's the framework, here's the background, the timeline. 1953, Watson and Crick and Wilkins and Franklin um, discover DNA. By the year 2000, we'd learned how to sequence our DNA and we were reading our genomes. And last year, for the first time, scientists were able to edit human genomes. So how did this happen? So of course, we're all familiar with Moore's law, right? That's the solid white line that says that computing power will increase every 18 months while the cost will decrease in a corresponding rate. And that led to an extraordinary amount of innovation and change and wealth creation and everything else. And we thought that was pretty impressive. But look at what's happening in genetic sequencing. You can see this point in 2007 where next generation sequencing technologies were released. And it was also the beginning of cloud computing. 
So those were the two things that have really accelerated our understanding of, of genomics. But the neobiological revolution is not just being fueled by a decline in sequencing costs. It's also coming about as a result of this extraordinary number of sensors that we have any, everywhere. You know, you have it in your phone, you have it in your Fitbit, you have it in your um, Apple Watch. We have wearable sensors, we have embeddable sensors, we have swallowable sensors. And all those sensors are collecting huge amounts of data about all of us, about our health, about our activity. Um, and the sen it's, so it's not just the sensors, it's the fact that we can do something with all of that data now. Neural networks and machine learning have advanced to a stage where we can start to actually find correlations and causations for what's happening. So it's machine learning is also driving that. Another thing driving that is imaging technology. Our imaging technology has gotten so advanced and so good that we can now see inside the body. We can see inside in a way that's allowed us to, to, to discover new biological circuits and new biological systems we didn't even know existed before. And of course, then we have the real accelerator here, which was the introduction of the smartphone. Last year, 1.5 billion smartphones were sold around the world. 64% of people in North America have a smartphone. So this has created the setup. It's a perfect setup for this extraordinary, spectacular new run of innovation. So we have increasingly powerful technology. We have rapidly declining costs. We have this incredible amount of data that we're collecting. And we have this widely distributed user base. So what are we going to do with this technology? Well, first thing we're going to do, of course, is hack our brains. Um, there are neurotechnologies that exist today to help us with our sleep, for instance. They can help us with our focus and our concentration. Uh, they can even help us prime our brains and our muscles to perform better in music or in sports. And of course, everybody wants to use your brain, to, wants to use technology to read your thoughts, right? Mind reading. We have Facebook way out in front on this. Great! We also have Elon Musk, who in his spare time, and with his spare change, where's my Model 3? That's what I want to know, is working on brain implants to augment human intelligence. But the company we're tracking at Neolife is called Open Water. This is a non-invasive technology. In fact, they've embedded sensors in um, electronics in a ski cap format that allows them to see inside the brain at a resolution of one neuron. It's extraordinary. And of course, there can be enormous opportunities here for diagnostics, uh, for treatments and therapies, but of course, this is an opportunity to read your thoughts and allow your thoughts to direct a computer or a machine. Oh, the, um, the, uh, <laughs> this is the next step. This is a brain on a chip. So we wrote a story about this company called Kaniku. They are actually putting neurons and silicone together to create a chip that can uh, reproduce limited amounts of brain function. In this case, the prototype they're working on now um, can sense chemicals in the air. But you can imagine how this could be used for drug development, how it could be used in agriculture, eventually for treating neurological diseases. But of course, what the founder talks about is this being the first step in a wetware artificial intelligence. So you've got you to keep track of Kaneku. So of course, this is the golden age of neuroscience. If you want to know what your kids should be studying, tell them neuroscience. Um, but it's also the golden age of genetics. And in fact, you could say that, that 2017 was possibly the tipping point for consumer genetics. Over 12 million Americans have had their genome sequenced now, and you know, the growth just continues on. But the fact remains that most of this technology is being driven by governments, large academic and research institutions. And so, in fact, um, under the Obama administration, they announced the um, Precision Medicine Initiative and allocated about $300 million to it. Uh, the UK has a, a, an initiative to sequence their uh, citizens, volunteers. Of course, China came out and announced their $9 billion Precision Medicine Initiative. So, Large state actors are taking this stuff very, very seriously um, and are, are what's really driving this forward. But there's people like my friend Ono Faber, who is a citizen scientist. 
He's an app developer in San Francisco, and he found out that he had a very rare uh, genetic condition called NF2. And because it's so rare, there's very few research dollars available to, to study his condition, and pharmaceutical companies have little incentive to develop drugs for it. So he did what any self-respecting Silicon Valley inhabitant would do. He sequenced his genome. And then he organized a genomic hackathon with help from people at Google and the National Institutes of Health. And now he's using crowdsourcing and social media to connect with other people suffering from NF NF2 and to build a company around that to help figure out what causes the disease and what potential treatments there could be for it. So um, you can't talk about genetics and genetic engineering without, of course, immediately having to talk about designer babies. So this could well be the first step towards designer babies. Um, researchers at the Chinese Academy of Sciences announced that they had used CRISPR, gene editing tool you've probably all heard of, uh, to knock out the myostatin gene in these beagles. Now, the myostatin gene actually regulates musculature and muscle development. And if you knock it out, the muscles continue to develop. Um, and so in this case, it's not quite as visual as you would like, but those beagles are super buff. I mean, you can see the muscles in their chests and in their necks. You know, this may be what the future of our athletes is. So my friend Josiah decided to try it on himself. So Josiah um, likes to pretend like he's a Yahoo, but you know, he's got a degree, an advanced degree, a PhD from the University of Chicago uh, in molecular biology. Uh, he also had a job at NASA as an astrobiologist. How cool is that? Um, he was working on things like using bacteria to recycle plastics and uh, terraforming Mars. Um, so Josiah considers himself a citizen scientist. In fact, he's got a company called The Odin, and he will sell you a bacterial CRISPR kit that allows you to make fun things like fluorescent beer, for instance. Um, but Josiah is a committed biopunk, and he likes the kind of stunt, stuntsman's approach to, uh, to freeing the tools of biology. So he's done a couple of stunts. One of them, and this is how I first heard about him, was to perform a fecal transplant on himself. And that is exactly what it sounds like. And we're not gonna talk any more about that. <laughs> Last year, he wanted to up the ante a little bit, so he injected himself with a plasmid containing a CRISPRed myostatin knockout, just to see what would happen. You know, his company, in fact, will give you a custom CRISPR edit. All you have to do is tell them the bacteria or the plant or the animal that you're interested in and the gene or sequence that you want edited, and he'll do it for you. Your own custom CRISPR edit costs you $150. So a lot of people think that these tools should stay in the realm of large institutions where they are highly regulated and controlled. You know, people think people like uh, Josiah are a threat to our humanity, to our, to our human race. But, you know, the fact is, the vast majority of scientists working with this technology are highly ethical, they are highly aware of the ethical ramifications of their work, and they're also highly regulated. And in fact, you know, he's part of a bigger movement. The genie is out of the bottle on this stuff. This technology is already thoroughly documented and widespread. There are over 169 DIY biospaces around the world, and I was actually delighted to discover that only 30% of them are in the United States. So they're in Brazil, and they're in India, and they're in Japan. They're in places that you would not expect. So no matter what regulations we pass, we can assume that somebody somewhere is going to be working on it in spite of the regulation. So Josiah likes the performative aspects of biotech, and that makes me think of Stellark, um, a man whose performances include uh, a robotic arm and acoustical sensors that he wires himself up with that tap into the metabolic, metabolic processes happening in his body that he then translates into music, light, and laser performances. By the way, this is from performances he was doing in the 80s. So what's Stellark up to these days? Implants. 
he created a silicone implant that he embedded in his forearm. And when I saw him a few months ago, he was working on embedding a microphone in that ear as a sort of IoT device so that people all over the internet could actually tap into and hear what his ear was sensing. It's not just artists, it's also fashion designers. Stella McCartney, a committed vegan and environmentalist, has been working with a company in the Bay Area called Bolt Threads on a substitute for leather. Um, they call it Milo, and it's made out of mycelium. This woman, Sasha Lauren, takes kombucha, which is a, uh, a fermented sugary tea, and mixes it with something that synthetic biologists know all about. It's called SCOBY, which is a symbiotic culture of bacteria and yeast. And the combination of the SCOBY and the kombucha forms cellulose threads, which she then weaves into textiles. And this is her kombucha fashion show. Um, you know, it's interesting because people are working with bacteria, they're working with yeast, they're also working with things like methane gas and carbon dioxide to make, of course, textiles and other new materials, but they're also making clean biofuels and they're making food products. For instance, um, fish meal uh, can be made from carbon dioxide. It's pretty amazing. So that brings us to food. We all know there's a massive revolution underway in the food industry, but two decades and 2,000 peer-reviewed studies later, 90% of scientists believe that genetically modified foods are not harmful to consumers. So that includes, in America at least, the um, American Medical Association, the National Academy of Science, the uh, American Association for the Advancement of Science, and the World Health Organization all believe GMO foods are safe for consumption. But only 30% of consumers would agree with them. And there's a huge amount of disinformation out there. There's a huge amount of economic interest in you not really understanding that reality. Um, so I want you to hear about some of what we are up against when we start thinking about the fact that genetically modified foods may well be the most efficient and most effective way to manage our land and water resources, to reduce our dependence on uh, pesticides and fertilizers, and to create maximum nutritional value for the 10 billion people we're expecting on this planet in the year 2050. But listen to this. Frankly, I trust the social media, like blogs like, you know, Bonnie Hari's or um, other moms that even just do a post. I trust what they say more than most medical doctors, more than the CDC, more than the FDA, more than the USDA, more than the EPA. That's real. I don't need a scientific study for that. I don't need a doctor to tell me that. This cracks me up. You can see this is a film from a, uh, a clip from a film called uh, Food Evolution, which I highly recommend. Um, but the Google search there is like Zen Honeycut Crazy. Um, you know, Zen has backing from the organic food industry. She's got hundreds of thousands of people who read her blog, Moms Across America. Um, and this is just part of what we have to do to combat um, attitudes with facts. Um, you know, we are being overwhelmed right now with huge amounts of technological and biotechnological change. You know, the stuff of science fiction is becoming reality. By the way, did you know this year is the 200th anniversary of the publication of Frankenstein, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein? So this is one of the reasons why we're all very focused on it. But if you look at, you know, television shows, films, books, you'll see us grappling with these possibilities. And they get terrifying to a lot of us. You know, whether you're talking about a rogue bioterrorist, you know, who releases some totally viral um, pandemic, um, whether you're talking about a, uh, you know, synthetic humans in revolt, or Orphan Black, Canadian, a Toronto program, uh, about clones that were created and are, are being manipulated by an evil corporation. This, these are just all signs of what it is that we're trying to figure out. So now is a time to take in a lot of new information. Now is a really good time to study biology. Um, you know, we have to re-examine our attitudes and our definitions of words like natural and organic and artificial. And we have to be willing to change our minds because there's a lot of people out there 
who are changing their minds. Bill Nye, the science guy, actually changed his mind about GMO foods after seeing that genetic sequencing had become 10 million times faster and more accurate than he thought. In vitro fertilization, 40 years ago, we thought that was against you know, God's will and that it was immoral and these people would be freaks. Today, we consider it a basic human right to have a baby with your partner who's genetically connected to you. What morally ambiguous biotechnologies are we confronting today that in another 20 or 40 years from now will be considered both natural and a human right? You know, the next generation has no such attitudes about science and technology. You can just ask Reina. We arrived at this point because it is in our nature to make tools. And as Don Tapscott so helpfully pointed out yesterday, you know, the digital revolution brought us great enrichment and great empowerment, but it also had its dark sides. You know, on the plus side, it gave us tremendous enrichment. It allowed us to give voice to marginalized communities. It gave us access to all the world's information and allowed us to find and form communities not just based on geography, but based on shared interests and experiences like patients and caregivers, for instance. You know, on the downside, it led to a complete loss of privacy. It led to a tribalization of our society um, and to the amplification of fake news. You know, but the fact is, the next stage of the digital revolution is biological. Bio is the new digital. As physics was to the 20th century, biology is to the 21st century. Diane Francis talked about ethical frameworks. Don Tapscott talked about a new social contract. What we need is to bring all of our humanity, all of our intelligence, and all of our wisdom to bear on the debates about how to deploy these biotechnological tools. Because if we're committed to living on a, a clean planet, to using smart and efficient energy sources, to biodiversity and to respect for individual rights, then the world that we inhabit and the worlds that we explore, the species that we create and the species that we evolve into can be balanced and healthy and self-sustaining and magnificent. Thank you. I like the magnificent part. Magnificent. Magnificent. It can be magnificent. Yeah. Take that picture.